She said I was boring. I took a sip of beer. They usually say cry in a beer, but I didn't shed a tear. Of course, I was disappointed, but there was nothing to grieve about. There was no need to mourn the woman who left me. Why cry if you can just find someone new? I wonder how often I hear women complain about the lack of decent men. It's funny how often I hear, all the good ones are already in a relationship. My male friends complain about the lack of women who are able to keep their promises. Many men suffer from divorce. It seems that the problem exists. I think people just don't realize how lucky they are. Spending years with a partner and learning all their addictions and quirks is wonderful. I didn't mind that she wanted something else or even someone else. It bothered me when she called me boring. I think she made me boring just to break up with me. It's deceptive. She hasn't officially broken up with me yet. She recently informed me that she had found someone else because she found me boring. In my youth I craved adventure. I went kayaking with friends to islands off the coast and along streams in the mountains. I even took the trouble to swim to Long Island. 12 miles away, despite warnings that it was too far for safe sailing. Surprisingly, I have walked this path several times without problems. I was happy to stay overnight at the beach of the state park on the island, and the next day, I rode back. Karen did not consider this to be the actions of a typical husband and father. I believed that my family relied on my safety and responsibility, and unnecessary risk was not part of that equation. In an attempt to prioritize my role as a father, I gave up skiing, a Triumph Spitfire motorcycle, scuba diving, mountain biking and rock climbing. Instead I chose carefully manicured slopes, deposited my cross-country motorcycle in Triumph, switched to a road bike, signed up for a gym with a climbing wall, and even started riding a minivan. And all this in order to become a good father. Yes, I drove a minivan with an artificial wood trim, I know it's not the most stylish choice, but I loved her, and that's all that mattered to me. Unfortunately, after she tamed my leisure time, she began to make demands on my work. She didn't like it when I had to travel, even if it was just for a day or two to negotiate deals. Sometimes I had to travel to London or Hong Kong on business. I successfully negotiated deals that benefited my company, but she despised international travel, which kept me away for weeks on end. The bonuses that came with the trips were a huge financial help, but my wife didn't like that I wasn't sitting at home. As soon as I became a partner, the number of my overnight trips decreased significantly. I could easily fly to domestic destinations, make deals and return home on the red-eye flight. But it took years to reduce the number of international trips. There was a dilemma. Either travel a lot, earn more money, move into the category of senior partners and delegate negotiations on deals to teams, or refuse to travel. I didn't want anyone else to go on business trips and reap the benefits of watching them climb the corporate ladder ahead of me. I was determined to outsmart the competition. By deftly combining reasons for traveling, I was able to earn a lot of praise in my pursuit of partnership. Having started using teleconferences early, I was ahead of everyone in using technology to do the necessary work. I took care of renting small planes for my teams so that we could make the most of the time we spent on the ground. Although this affected my premiums, in the end, the investment paid off. As I walked up the ramp, Karen's joy was obvious and everyone was safe. And yet I couldn't get rid of the feeling of boredom. I had sacrificed everything to satisfy her needs and now I felt bored. It was frustrating. So I made a decision. I decided to let her seek out thrills while I rediscover the version of myself I once loved. A version of herself who found pleasure in pursuing her passions. This is the version of me who experienced the thrill of defying gravity when taking off from a muddy hill during motocross. One day I went on an exciting helicopter flight in search of pristine snow on a remote slope to spend the whole day riding through its pristine terrain. Subsequently I returned to the same slope in the summer and conquered it again. She assumed that I would be content to stay at home and wait for her. Do you remember that security protocol we discussed? Obviously I had to be ready in case she needed help on a date. It's absurd. After 25 years of marriage, 
followed by four years of friendship and dating during my school years, I always thought she was smart. It turned out that this was not the case. I have never agreed to such an offer. I had no intention of running errands for her while she was pursuing her own interests. It didn't matter if I was on the phone or waiting for her to come home, the routine became monotonous. As soon as she walked through the door, all feelings of responsibility and obligation seemed to disappear. Love, honor, care, and obedience became empty words. She had made it clear that obedience was not something she was interested in, and now I understood why. The idea that I was bored would not have occurred to me if only she had been willing to obey. When she got out of the shower, I quickly changed into jeans and a hoodie and reached for my old shoes. She has always been partial to my shoes, whether they are riding boots or hiking boots. Despite the changes, I couldn't deny that I still looked good in these boots. They fit as perfectly as ever. Despite the fact that I had gained weight over the years, the upper part of my body remained muscular. Now the boots accentuated my broad shoulders and manly chest even more. A light smell of aftershave and a strict sports jacket completed my new look. There was no doubt that I was no longer waiting for her, and it was obvious that she was unhappy with my transformation. What are your plans for the evening? I asked with a grin. Nothing special, she replied, looking unimpressed with my casual attire. But who says that boring can't be stylish? I asked. Before she could protest, I was already out the door, ready for the weekend ahead. The minivan started up with a roar, or rather, with a purr, okay, it was shaking and struggling, but I managed to get out of there before Karen had time to get dressed, and I couldn't help but grin when I saw her running out into the street in a bathrobe. Shortly after, my cell phone rang, but I decided to ignore it and send it to voicemail. I have come up with a new greeting especially for this situation. Hi, this is Dale. I won't be able to answer your call right now because I'm either driving or just boring as usual. If you need a little thrill, contact my wife Karen at 500 Petty 55 348. Otherwise, leave a message and I'll call you back when I can. Just don't expect an immediate response. Maybe by Monday. Take care of yourself. Dale. I needed to get rid of an old minivan with faux wood trim. I wanted something more austere and at the same time elegant maybe even with real wood paneling, like the old Willis van. He'd look great with a surfboard on the roof, wouldn't he? I was looking for the perfect combination or the old Willis Woody, but I didn't find it. Now that I've freed myself from this boring and spirit-killing tangle of chains, I can enjoy riding in something that feels both elegant and rough without giving up on it. I was so bored that I almost thought about taking the checkbook from our cash account and leaving. But there was no way I was going to go home. Instead, I decided to treat myself. I bought two cars, one austere and one elegant. The Mercedes dealer was happy to help me find the perfect convertible. There is nothing more elegant than driving around the city in a Mercedes convertible. I'm not bored anymore and I couldn't be happier. The dealer had a huge Jeep in the range of used cars, equipped with intimidating lifts, huge tires, powerful fog lights and a loud train horn, as well as many other improvements. I left in a Jeep, and the convertible was delivered to my house and parked in my driveway on Sunday morning. She said I'm boring, but I've never liked boredom. The version of me she imagined was terribly boring. Leaving this story, I buried it deep inside myself, going in search of the first thrills. I bought a trailer and returned to my roots, but not to the house that my wife and I shared but to my mother's house. It's been a few months since I last saw her, and it was high time for me to do it. The three-hour trip was exciting because I rediscovered the joy of driving a powerful car. Mom was very happy to see me and cooked my favorite lasagna for dinner. She did not ask why I came alone or why my wife was not with me, but she felt that something was wrong. She's always been able to understand me. The next morning I went to the barn and got out my trusty old Spitfire. It had been there for several years, but my brother took it out from time to time to make sure it was still in working order. The motorcycle wasn't so lucky, but I didn't have to start it to load it onto the trailer. By lunchtime, both the motorcycle and the car were securely attached to the trailer. 
and I saw happiness in my mother's eyes. Well, are you finally going to tell me about it? What is it? She asked, a smile playing on her lips. I couldn't help but smile back. What should I tell you, Mom? About the 25 years during which I lived the way Karen wanted me to? You raised three children by transporting them in minivans and riding rabbit slides. And then, out of the blue, you show up without your wife, driving a huge truck, without a sports car and motorcycle and in stylish shoes, she replied. Mom always saw right through me. I told her about Karen's recent mental health issues. Maybe she's a little crazy, but in the end, she helped you break free, she concluded. Mom was never wrong. That night, I finally turned on my phone. Karen and the kids have been calling and texting nonstop all day. I joined the children in a text conversation and answered, I'm fine. I'm at my grandmother's now. Your mother and I had a disagreement, and I decided that I needed time to think. So I came here to stay. My daughter Ollie was very worried and said, Mom says you're missing and she doesn't know why. I replied, I'm not going to lie to you and I'm not going to explain the details. It's not in my area of expertise. All I can say is that your mom has decided that I'm boring and I'm taking steps to fix it. Jenny, my second daughter, said, Dad, this is not typical of mom. She always puts safety first and will never put you or our family at risk. It's very important that you come home and resolve this situation. I appreciate your trust in me, but before you judge me, why not hear the truth from your mother? I suggested. Dad, we're not pointing fingers. We just want you both to know that we love you and want the best for you, my son Daniel said. Thank you, son. Keep me posted when you talk to mom, I replied. I spent the evening with my mom, laughing at an old uninteresting movie. When I was about to finish the evening, a message came to my phone. It was a message from Jenny expressing her shock and disappointment that her mom had gone to another man. I comforted her by telling her that I was going to continue living the same way as before. I decided that I would not let the rules of my ex-wife dictate to me how to live, especially since she did not follow the rules of our marriage. I realized that she had freed me from the need to live on my own terms. Hi Dad, this is Daniel. Kiss Grandma for me. When I get home next weekend I want to ride a Spitfire. I laughed. You guys know me and Grandma well. You can count on it. How about skiing on spring break? I asked. Maybe somewhere with a helicopter instead of a T-bar, Ollie suggested. What can I say? My children know everything about what I do and what I'm passionate about. They've seen pictures of me skiing and in the mud after motocross. Yes, it's definitely me. I'm thinking about going to Banff to get in shape. Hiking on rural trails can be enjoyable, but it's definitely hard work. Boring. On Sunday morning, my mother and I found ourselves in our favorite bakery. I stayed to help her with the housework. During lunch, a text message came to my phone, and I couldn't help but grin when I heard the furious message from Karen. The couriers brought my Mercedes, but accidentally locked the keys inside, as I had a spare set. Karen only had time to stare at him after locking the car in the garage. It looks like I'm going to have to tip the couriers extra for this incident. When I got home, Karen's car was already parked. I backed up the driveway, parked my Jeep, and then got into my brand new Mercedes to drive away. I couldn't help but grin when I saw Karen running out of the car trying to stop me. After driving off, I left her looking at my new Jeep, which was loaded with her twin nemesis, my Spitfire, and my Kawasaki. It was food for thought for her. At least now her part of the garage was free, and she could easily leave if she wanted to. But she rejected the idea as too simple and boring. I wasn't going to go home. After a successful shopping trip at the mall to pick up some new outfits for the near future, I headed to the Hyatt Hotel, located near my office. Choosing a luxurious penthouse suite, I reminded myself that hard work and dedication had brought me all these bonuses over the years. With a contented heart, I sank into a peaceful slumber. The next day, I returned to work and informed my team that I was going on our next trip to Hong Kong. 
This trip involved negotiating 160 acres of prime real estate, and the task required my experience and guidance. Since the negotiations had reached an impasse, it was a great opportunity for me to step in and demonstrate my boss skills. My team was delighted and supported my decision to take matters into my own hands. Encouraging them, I prepared to flex my muscles and solve the tasks that needed to be solved during this important business trip. During the visit, they gathered three more potential purchases to consider. Why wait? I asked when they presented their first research on these sites. Let's go take a look, but be ready to make a purchase. Inform our on-site staff that we are approaching quickly and they should be ready to process a significant number of documents. Pack your things for at least a month. If you can't handle it, make arrangements with Ian's group. Feel free to invite your families to visit during your absence. Let's avoid marriage problems because of such intense work. If you decide to join me, I am ready to cover the costs of the hotel, flights, and the entire trip. I also organize some sightseeing activities. The main thing for me is that you are happy, motivated, and productive during this trip, which will last a month and maybe longer. Before returning, I plan to visit Sydney and meet with a group of hotels in Buenos Aires. In addition, while we are in Hong Kong, the yen will be sent to Seoul and Mumbai. This is a fantastic opportunity for us to make a significant profit. Welcome. We are glad to see you here. Carter Douglas, my best trained negotiator, smiled at me. Returning the smile, I turned to my colleague Kim, who understands numbers. Kim, can I talk to you for a minute? I took her to my office and told my secretary to hold all calls, especially from my wife. Kim nodded understandingly as I closed the door behind us. This is an important opportunity for you, Kim. We must act quickly and accurately. A lot of what we buy will be sold soon after we return home. Every transaction must be smooth and timely. Although some of our purchases may be undesirable, they will attract sellers who have the things we need, which will allow us to exchange them for what we really need. In addition, we will enter new markets to promote our products, focusing on long-term rather than short-term profits. These strategic steps will impress our partners and pave the way for career growth from a junior employee to a more profitable position. This is your opportunity to shine, I said. I expect you to always be in touch and ready to support any argument or statement I make at any time of the day or night, I finished. Does that mean... Kim asked, raising an eyebrow suggestively. I smiled. Does this mean that you can use your charm to succeed? No. I will not tolerate such actions from anyone. You'll have to earn your place just like everyone else, I replied. It was undeniable. She was a stunning beauty, slender and graceful, with legs perfectly matched to her attractive buttocks. The low-cut tops she always wore seductively showed off her luscious curves, reminiscent of ripe mangoes. Remember your role. You're here to work for me. I expect that during this trip you will always be ready to fulfill any business assignment that I may need. You'll pick me up in a limo on Friday morning dressed in your most seductive outfit. I want my wife to worry about our relationship so try to make a lasting impression. When you arrive come to me to see me off and ask Ian to be our driver. I want my wife to be very jealous when I leave. My team was motivated, my wife was desperate to see me, and my kids were furious with my wife. Kim had amorous feelings not only for me, but also to get a promotion. It may not be much for me, but I've set boundaries. I went to the airport to rent a plane, thinking about the idea of skydiving. Of course I wasn't going to hurt myself. I just wanted to reconnect with the thrill-seeker I was in my youth. I had to force myself to move and experience an adrenaline rush. It was incredible. I even rented a camera to capture this stunt with my jumping partner. After writing about it on Facebook, I quietly went to bed. The next day, my phone was full of missed calls and messages from the kids, and Karen was furious. The children were delighted, but Karen was not impressed. It was clear that changes were needed. I decided to regain my true self, despite Karen's disapproval. I didn't want to confront her so I quietly packed up my things and left while she was at work. 
I decided to make a spontaneous trip to Chicago by taking a late flight from the airport. Although I didn't have any urgent reasons to travel, there were some potential opportunities waiting for me. The trip turned out to be very successful and allowed me to avoid Karen before the upcoming big trip. I arrived very late on Thursday evening and found the house dark. As a result, Karen returned home around 2 o'clock in the morning, not noticing that I was already there. Fortunately, she was alone, and I didn't have to deal with the fact that she brought young people to our house. Thus, I managed to avoid meeting her until I was ready to confront her. I woke up early, and my newly packed luggage was already at the door. I made a hearty breakfast of steak and eggs while listening to ZZ Top on the stereo in the kitchen. I was wearing well-fitting gabardine trousers and a stylish sports shirt that Karen had never seen before. The outfit was perfect for a long 18-hour trip to Asia, combining style and comfort effortlessly. Karen came down the stairs, attracted by the aroma of my delicious coffee. I was proud to make excellent coffee. Oh my god, Dale, you're home. Honey, why didn't you answer my calls? I was so worried, she asked. The kids told me you were worried. Don't worry, I'm fine. I'm just minding my own business, I replied. Oh no, you can't leave it like that. This is an insufficient explanation, she said. It's a simple explanation. Last week you said you were going to have your own way and I couldn't stop you. And I thought that if my dear wife does what she wants, then I can do the same. This is the new us, I replied. I can accept it. I didn't tell you that I'm going to do whatever I want. I just said that I was thinking about dating other men. Now I understand. But I didn't want that. She began to justify herself. So, if you can make such an important decision against my wishes, I don't need to ask you for my choice, I said. You have a family to take care of. A husband and father should not ride motorcycles or drive sports cars. I thought we had already discussed this many years ago. And we discussed it, Karen insisted. Over time, Karen and I have aged and our circumstances have changed. For you and the children we made sacrifices, giving up our own desires. I even drove a minivan and went skiing with my family on easy trails. It's been years since I last skydived. You said I was boring but in fact I just didn't feel motivated. Now that the kids are grown up and they have enough money for college, there's a secret surprise for you and them. Each of them has a trust fund that will be available to them after they graduate from college, I told her. They will have enough money to get a college degree and make a down payment on a beautiful house in any place they choose. Let's face it, the kids will be fine no matter what happens to me, I said. What are you preparing for? If the project is launched and I end my life doing something amazing, I will leave with a smile on my face knowing that they will be taken care of, I replied. And as for me, you know I'm interested in your future too, she persisted. You have another man, Karen. I don't want to break the bad news, but I may not be around, I replied. What? Wait a minute, Dale, that's too much of an assumption. We have just started to study this whole situation, she said indignantly. I already know that I don't matter much to you anymore. If that were the case, you wouldn't have given me such an ultimatum. You think I'm boring, and that's okay. I have other ways to have fun. I sacrificed a lot to become a family man, but apparently it wasn't enough for my wife not to seek solace elsewhere. Just as I was about to start another argument, the doorbell rang, which saved me from further altercation. It was Kim and Jane, and they looked amazing. Let's not forget how amazing I looked in my gabardine suit. The shade only complemented my already flawless look. Jane greeted me warmly, hugged and kissed me, and then with a quick movement began loading my four suitcases into a waiting limousine. Meanwhile, Kim handed me the dossier and began quickly listing the numbers and details of our ongoing negotiations. When she mentioned the names of the projects and places like Hong Kong, Sydney and Buenos Aires, Karen's attention was completely captured. She couldn't help but ask, How long will you be gone? Just for a couple of months. I'm counting on you to have enough time to study everything before you get too old. But please do me a favor and don't bring them into the house, I said. Karen begged with a frenzy that could rival a telethon on public television. She had a whole list of reasons why I should stay. 
She insisted that we need to talk about the development of our relationship and where we are going, but I had to stop her. Honey, now is not the time. Our relationship is not developing, it has already ended, and I'm leaving at the moment. See you in a few months. As we walked to the car, I couldn't make out a word of her meaningless chatter. But I couldn't help but chuckle when she noticed my Jeep, Spitfire and convertible parked in front of the garage gate. Her words were too rude to repeat. I couldn't deny that Hong Kong is really amazing. Kim lived in a room next to mine, which ensured her constant professional presence nearby, as we both agreed. She was well versed in numbers, which allowed us to successfully complete all the proposed deals and create subsequent opportunities for future teams to conclude them within a month. Our efforts in Australia bore fruit, as a result of which a preliminary agreement was reached on the acquisition of a whole group of hotels, and the team was supposed to return in a month to close the deal. We also identified potential acquisition opportunities in Argentina, where I managed to negotiate with a motivated seller, expanding our corporate portfolio with new projects. All these years, I have remained faithful to my marriage vows and believed that Karen would eventually come to her senses and want to make peace. It was a lie. Karen may have gone a little crazy, but she was still very dear to me. I wasn't ready to give up on her. Therefore, I took her ultimatum as an offer of a free marriage, when we can stay married, but at the same time have the freedom to be with other people. It seemed like a simple solution. Carrie Moore, an old college friend, has become a successful buyer for wealthy tourists in Hong Kong. She devoted the whole day to showing my team the sights of the city and taking us through the bustling markets. Before our 12-day stay here came to an end, she recommended a high-class tailor to me. By the time I left for Sydney, I had a whole collection of custom-made suits. That evening, we had a passionate date, satisfying our desires. It was exactly what I needed, a reliable woman, a luxurious hotel room in an unfamiliar city, an unbridled passion. The guilt quickly dissipated when I remembered Karen's advice. Did she say I'm boring? I realized that I had never been boring, but I was definitely bored. Carrie, with her quivering body and intense climaxes, was far from boring. It was obvious that she wasn't bored with me either. When we set off from Hong Kong to Sydney, we hired a guide named Sydney, who showed us the stunning city during the day and charmed me at night with her brown hair and slender figure. I really enjoyed my time in Sydney, both the city itself and the company of the Sydney Guide. Rio turned out to be no less fruitful in terms of business opportunities. Our performances in Asia and Australia surpassed all our recent endeavors, but we were still able to extend our stay abroad. During our travels, I had the pleasure of meeting a passionate Latin American divorcee, who taught me the art of tango both on the dance floor and in the bedroom. When we made business deals I sent my team home on commercial flights, and a few days later I decided to use a private jet. During the flight the flight attendants welcomed me to the Mile High Club and introduced me to the intricacies of the threesome game. I had an amazing trip, but I still had a lot to do. It was a bit boring. In general you get it. Before returning home, I went to Canada to go skiing for a while. Before Christmas, I was reunited with my children in Banff. Why not? They passed the exams a week before and surprised mom by coming home for the holidays. We spent an incredible time skiing on the steep snow-covered slopes, which could only be reached by helicopter. I spent my evenings at parties with children. I hired a gorgeous blonde housewife I met at a bar after she told me about how her husband traded her for a younger model. I provided her with a generous housing allowance and offered to pay the moving expenses so that she would become my personal assistant. But I made this offer only on the third night of our acquaintance. Every night they spent together, she screamed with pleasure in different languages, and by the third night, it was already the sixth language. Realizing that her translation skills would be a valuable addition to our expanding international business, I decided to hire her. Unfortunately, this also meant the end of our personal relationship. Despite my ex-wife's betrayal and the dissolution of our marriage, my professional ethics remained intact. When our week in Banff came to an end, 
we flew home a few days before Christmas. The children went to visit their mother, and I decided to stay at a hotel near the office. I didn't plan on fighting Karen and jet sleep at the same time. I was able to buy an apartment as a Christmas gift for myself and decided to spend the holiday with my wife and children. When I arrived at the place, I noticed that my cars were still parked on the street and there was a small Cooper convertible next to my Spitfire. I was worried that my wife, Karen, would be upset about this situation, but to my surprise, she welcomed me cordially, as if everything was fine. Maybe she wasn't as uninterested in me as I thought. We celebrated Christmas together, enjoying her delicious food. I helped her with the cleaning and took out the trash, feeling grateful for the time I spent with my family. I parked the Mercedes and the Spitfire in the designated areas and drove off in my Jeep. While I was driving, the phone rang. I was hoping for a peaceful Christmas truce and fortunately we both enjoyed it. After thinking about the kids, I decided to stay for a couple more days. I stayed in the guest room overnight. The day after Christmas, I took each car to the car wash, realizing that leaving them outdoors for four months might not have been the best decision. After putting the Spitfire in the garage, I made a mental note to do the same with the Jeep. The day after Christmas, Karen decided to have another fight when her boyfriend came to lunch. With a smug smile, she provoked an argument. Deciding to stand my ground, I went upstairs to get my bag before getting completely involved in the conflict. The children were clearly offended by Karen and took her by surprise with their anger. She did not expect their reaction, thinking that the situation would develop differently. It was the holiday season which further increased the tension. When we were preparing to leave, the children said goodbye to Karen, not to me. We quickly loaded their bags into the Jeep and drove towards the city center. On New Year's Eve, there was an endless amount of entertainment in the city and we were ready to party to the fullest. We explored museums during the day and visited clubs at night. Since both children had friends nearby, the three of us had the opportunity to spend time together or go about our business. I even found some time for myself, although not quite alone. By the time I returned to work, I had listened to enough music, visited many museums, enjoyed delicious food and drank enough wine and whiskey to last a lifetime. I got into a new routine which was quite unusual. My successful campaign in the Southern Hemisphere that fall not only boosted my status in the company, but also attracted the attention of our competitors. Other companies started following me, impressed by our bold show of strength. I was transparent with my team, telling them that if I left, they would come with me. Naturally, the news of this potential move reached the senior partners, which led to a call to the boss's office. There I found out that Karen's grandfather founded the company. After her father turned the business into a large corporation with several manufacturing units, I was hired when I married Karen. Starting work as a junior analyst was quite consistent with my education and skills. Despite signing a prenuptial agreement that prevented me from claiming Karen's future inheritance from a company that was mostly owned by her father, I worked hard. Although I had a warm relationship with Mr. Adams, we were not particularly close. He preferred to keep a professional distance from his employees, including his son-in-law. At first, this approach seemed strange to me, but as I moved up the career ladder, I realized how it helps him avoid favoritism. I followed his example and maintained a purely business relationship, refusing invitations to chat with colleagues. So I wasn't surprised when Adams got straight to the point and noted my recent successes at work. I sank into the small chair in front of his desk, amazed. My daughter has won this battle, and I can't help but wonder if I should be worried about her growing independence, he began. The psychology of the short chair in front of the table and the high chair behind was not incomprehensible to me. I knew that towering over an opponent was a dominant position, but I also knew that it made you vulnerable to unexpected attacks. Maybe they've never watched movies in which an invincible warrior win? Yes, sir, it is, I replied, feeling the weight of my defeat after 25 years at the firm. 
I am still a junior partner. Despite the fact that over the past five years I have made more profit than any other manager. My Asian Blitz last year was second to none, resulting in a bigger bonus than any other employee, including department presidents. But I'm thinking about getting a standard severance package and leaving, I said. Dale, I can't promote you like everyone else because you're my son-in-law. How will it be perceived? I understand that business is business, but it works both ways, he replied. For me, Business is about using opportunities that match my skills and potential. I have the opportunity to become a full partner at either Woodford Unlimited or Mark Manufacturing. In return, I expect a certain loyalty from my son-in-law, which is quite fair, Karen's father said. It is ironic that loyalty suddenly becomes a priority when it serves your interests, but is ignored when it is not beneficial to you. Speaking of family loyalty, I would like to discuss how you instilled this value in your daughter, because it seems there has been a mistake here, I replied angrily. Dale, I apologize for raising this issue, but it should have been raised. Why can you be Mr. Adams and I'm just Dale? Business is business, and I deserve the same respect as you, I asked indignantly. All right, Mr. Carter, whatever you say, he replied. But don't forget that last May I received my PhD in economics. So, Dr. Carter, I reminded him. I am unhappy with my daughter's behavior and we had a serious conversation on this topic. Unfortunately, she's not talking to me right now. My approach to parenting clearly needs to be improved, he began conciliatingly. I stepped in to finish his speech for him because his philosophy of loyalty is completely out of line with the rest of the world. Treating business as purely transactional, is just a way to justify being seen as a heartless boss with the warmth of a lifeless fish. Is it really wise to keep your best performer just because he happens to be your son-in-law? I see no reason not to use my talents elsewhere. After all, this arrogant man dared to force me to give my all. And that's exactly what I did. By the end of the working day, all members of my team, including Ian and his team, had submitted their resignation. The sudden wave of departures took everyone by surprise. But instead of leaving, I negotiated a new partnership that provided for a significant salary increase for me and raises for both our teams. In addition, a mergers and acquisitions division were created specifically for us. Now that my professional and financial future was secured, I decided to focus on my personal life. I enjoyed exploring challenging trails and dirt tracks on my motorcycle. I even participated in motocross races. I pushed myself to the limit by going down the mountain on a mountain bike and getting covered in mud. I looked disheveled and haggard, covered in dirt, while chatting with a couple of bikers who found my appearance attractive. One of them, a Harley fan, admired my motocross skills and praised me for jumping despite my age. She jokingly suggested that I contact her when I switch to a more powerful motorcycle than my current one. In response, I joked that what I drive requires more than just two wheels. While I was securing the bike to the back seat of my sturdy Jeep, she loaded her Harley onto the same platform. We spent the evening discussing the advantages of maneuverability over the durability of our motorcycles. We compared motorcycles to intense, thrilling rocket races filled with sweat, stickiness, and excitement. I went skiing in Banff and conquered Tuckerman. But when the summer heat closed the legendary slopes on Mount Washington, I went in search of spectacular descents and icy glaciers in the Pyrenees. It was funny to watch naked women sunbathing in a high-altitude house next to a snow-covered slope. Watching them continue to undress in your hotel room is even more enjoyable. After making a lot of tandem jumps from a perfectly serviceable plane, I finally qualified for single jumps. The same instructor gave me enough hours on a sailing plane so that I could fly alone. She was delighted that the student received both solo certificates in one month and allowed me to fly with her. We decided to jump naked and practice exercises on a deserted beach after landing. Unfortunately, we couldn't figure out how to do the same in a sailing plane because of the back-to-front seating arrangement. The seats prevented us from making love, so we decided to go back to the beach again. The weather was scorching for the first time, so why not have an encore? 
I shared all the details on Facebook, and my feed was flooded with comments from our friends and relatives, especially children who, like me, avoided their moms. I wasn't going to make contact with her either. She tried to resist, but I was constantly on the move. You can't catch a moving target. After each message, my phone rang, but I didn't block her number. I ignored her attempts to contact me, even when she used her father to convince me to talk. He did not repeat this mistake after I made it clear that I would go to Woodford if he insisted. He had to physically restrain her so that I could leave without being harassed. It's amazing what some people get to. Then the relentless pressure began. Family members, friends, even the neighbor's cat seemed to be on her side, urging me to give her another chance. After all, everyone makes mistakes sometimes, right? I asked them to take my place. I asked them to imagine that their partners were cheating on them. If mistakes are made so casually and so easily forgiven, then why not make a few of your own? It seemed appropriate to start with someone who understands this concept. Although they were shocked at first, they eventually understood my reasoning. I knew that some people might never talk to me again after what I had done. And to be honest, it didn't bother me too much. I got tired of the cheap advice that was dragging me down and decided to leave. I took my team with me and we hit the road again, much to their delight. Our first trip was to Asia and Argentina, and this time we went to Brazil and Argentina and then returned to Hong Kong. Our journey was incredibly successful, so much so that we were able to rent space and open our first international office in Asia. Even Karen's father had nothing to say against it. Because our successful work in the Southern Hemisphere has created a significant amount of business, I was appointed Vice President of Operations. I assigned Jan to oversee operations in Argentina and Kim in Australia, which led to significant business growth in our division. Instead of returning home, I stayed in the Southern Hemisphere. Although Karen expressed a desire to join me, our children convinced her otherwise. I made the decision not to let her follow me, and strangely enough, she agreed. I sent the Spitfire and the motorcycle back to my mother, and gave my son a Jeep and my daughter a Mercedes. After I divorced Karen, I decided to propose to someone else. I wanted to share my life with a good woman, and I found one who loves skydiving. Now I have everything I want, adrenaline, a happy home, a new beginning, my honesty and a lot of money that can be earned in a new place. If Karen had just said that she was bored and wanted to try something new together, I would have been thrilled. We could go skiing together, which would be very exciting because I taught her and led her on the slopes. We could go on an adventure rafting on rivers or zipline through Cambodia with minimal risk, but with a lot of adrenaline. I was willing to do anything for her until she chose someone else over me, which was hard for me to accept. I've heard that she's unhappy with the dating scene, believing that available guys don't meet the requirements. She is jealous that her father appreciates me very much for leaving her. We bring incredible income to his company. She repents of her actions but realizes that she cannot change the past. Carrie is always ready for any adventure, whether it's jumping into a helicopter in ski boots, strapping on a parachute, or just the pleasure of going to bed with her every night. There's nothing in bed that Carrie wouldn't try, and there's nothing she wouldn't enjoy when we're together. I can say that because as soon as we try something new, she always wants to repeat it. This didn't happen to Karen, even when we were younger and our relationship was strong. Since the day her father had to restrain her so that I could leave without being attacked, we haven't spoken. I'm sure she would like to talk, but she knows that I have no desire to communicate with her. Eventually, one of the children may get married or have a grandson, and I will strive to attend this event. Most likely, Karen will be there, and I will have to communicate with her. But I'm not worried. When that time comes, my Carrie will be by my side. She won't be there to protect me, but rather to keep me from being too boring and boring. I'm happy with Carrie. She's exactly the woman I need. As for Karen, she doesn't have such a fun and happy life as I do. She was bored with me. So now she probably has fun spending time with more cheerful and younger men than me, who only need her for one night. Karen has never managed to have a serious relationship with any of them. 
young men needed from her either her wealth or intimacy for one night. As a result, promiscuous sex life led Karen to a sexually transmitted disease. Now her thoughts are not about fun, but about treatment. She said I was boring. My name is Nick. I work as the chief of detectives for the sheriff's department. I've been married to Nancy for 19 years. The first time I met her was when she was in an accident. Are you okay? I asked a young woman who was hit by a car at high speed. She was disoriented and did not understand her surroundings. I gently brushed her hair away from her face. She was just stunned. Paramedics arrived and took her to the hospital. I got a call and was informed that the team had caught the driver and put him in his place. The next day, I went to the hospital to take a statement on her version. When I entered her room, my heart was pounding. Hey doc, where's the girl who came last night? The one that was shot down. Oh, Nancy Miller, she was lucky. There are no serious injuries, only a concussion. But don't put too much pressure on her, he said. I entered the room. Miss Nancy, my name is Nick Anderson from the local police. I'm here to document your account of what happened last night. She told me what had happened, and I diligently wrote down her words in my notebook. When I finished, I expressed my gratitude and left. When I got out, my heart was pounding with the force of a powerful V8 engine. It dawned on me, maybe I fell in love with her. As fate would have it, a few days later I unexpectedly met her at a local fair, accompanied by her friends. Deciding not to miss this opportunity, I approached her and plucked up the courage to ask her out on a date. The situation seemed awkward and unusual to me, but she smiled warmly in response. At 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon, I drove up to her house in my car. Surprised, she asked how I knew where she lived. Smiling confidently, I replied, I'm a policeman. It's my job to know these things. Her laughter filled the air, and we went on a date. Our meetings continued, and soon we found that our relationship was blossoming. During our conversation, she openly shared details about her parents, aspirations, and even about her ex-fiancé. It turned out that for the last three years, she had been engaged to a man named Mike Smith, but he left her to marry the daughter of a rich Texan. Curiosity got the better of me, and I discreetly checked his background. To my surprise, everything she told me about him was confirmed. Mike was happily married to Maria, and they had a charming one-year-old daughter. With the exception of a few minor speeding tickets, Mike was clean and had no criminal record. He held the position of financial advisor at his father-in-law's firm. On my day off, I decided to conduct further investigation, being sure that there would be no negative consequences. In the worst case, I could get off with a light reprimand for being too assertive. To my surprise, I found that Mr. and Mrs. Smith are a genuinely loving couple. There were no signs of conflict or disagreement between them. One of the neighbors even called them the epitome of the perfect couple. I was no longer worried that he would ruin the party, as I was comforted by Mike's happy marriage. With such calmness, I continued to meet with Nancy. Eventually, a year later, we tied the knot, and soon, after almost nine months, our precious daughter Jill was born. Eighteen of the nineteen years of our life together have been wonderful. Of course, we had disagreements, but until recently there was nothing too significant. As a rule, our conflicting opinions arose when we had different ideas about certain activities. It is worth noting that Nancy, being an only child, was spoiled by her parents. Over time, she managed to tame her stubborn character. She owned and operated her own event management company specializing in organizing grand celebrations. When our daughter came into our lives, Jill became the apple of my eye. Our bond was incredibly strong and the family was friendly. But in the last year, Nancy and I have started to drift apart. I began to notice that we were spending less and less time together, doing less and less common things. Despite this, our intimate moments remained passionate and took place at least twice a week, and often more often. Nancy radiated pure joy whenever we found ourselves in each other's arms. It was obvious that her love for me was very deep, 
and I cherished this fact. Over time, our love changed. It no longer burned with such passion as in the early days of our marriage. Instead, we became like a pair of well-worn shoes, weathered by years, but perfectly matching each other. Despite this, my love for Nancy remained deep, and I cherished the life we had built together. When Jill's high school career came to an end, Nancy's behavior changed noticeably. She looked restless, as if she was plagued by a sense of purposelessness, especially with Jill's impending departure for college. Nancy was getting more and more anxious. As the newly appointed chief of detectives for the sheriff's department, I now led a team of 32 detectives. Considering that our district was not particularly crime-ridden, the work as a whole did not require excessive stress. Of course, sometimes there were tense moments, but mostly it was the usual routine from morning to evening. About a month after Jill left, Nancy invited me to a party hosted by one of her friends. Although I've been to their house before, this party took me by surprise. Nancy briefly introduced me to Brian, her ex-fiancé, and quickly took me away from the meeting. I had absolutely no idea that Mike would be present, but I was sure that Nancy knew about it in advance. It was typical for her to separate from me and communicate, so I didn't pay attention to it. An hour later, I decided to look for her and found her sitting on the porch with Mike. As soon as I went outside, I noticed a slight redness on Nancy's neck, which indicated that she was involved in something that I would not approve of. As a police officer, I developed an inner instinct, and it told me that this situation could lead to trouble. On the way home, we discussed Mike's unexpected presence. Nancy tried to dismiss the meeting as if she was genuinely surprised by his appearance and to give the impression that they were just remembering past times. Her words were incoherent, and her presentation lacked clarity. Despite this, I made a conscious decision not to exaggerate the situation, but to remain vigilant. As a policeman, I often face very unpleasant circumstances, but it is very important to approach them with composure and professionalism. Sometimes it can be incredibly frustrating. The next day at work, I conducted another investigation into Mike. I found out that a year ago his wife tragically died under suspicious circumstances. The details were scant and hinted at a hasty investigation, which was wisely kept silent. Despite this, Mike managed to get the insurance money, which instantly increased his fortune. Surprisingly, there was no evidence against him. Nothing set him apart from the general mass. It turned out that he was in Japan when his wife took her last breath, which effectively excludes him from the list of suspects. Over time, we began to run into Mike more and more by chance at various social events. It became obvious that these meetings were not just a coincidence, and I began to prepare for an ominous denouement. I assumed that Nancy would eventually come to me for a conversation, and that day seemed imminent. And indeed, she started the conversation when I least expected it. It happened on a Friday night, and Nancy put on a dress that I cherished, clothes that are usually worn before intimate moments. Reacting quickly, I hugged her, realizing that such intimate encounters had become rare and decided not to waste time. Without delay, I started the conversation, making sure that its climax was intense and powerful. When we finished talking, we snuggled up to each other, and at that moment, all my worries seemed trivial to me. It became obvious to me that Nancy's love for me is still as deep as ever. She approached me hesitantly, nervousness in her voice. Nick, I need to talk to you about something, she began, begging me to stay calm. Please let me finish before you react. Her words hit me like a powerful blow, leaving me standing in a daze. She said that Mike was her first love, and one day they got engaged and were going to get married. But their relationship broke up when he fell in love with his now deceased wife. Mike recently contacted her, expressing his love and deep loneliness. She reluctantly admitted that she still had feelings for him. But my love for you remains unchanged. Although I was silent, it was difficult for me to regulate my breathing and keep my composure. Nancy took this as a sign of newfound determination 
and smiled encouragingly as she continued. I want to remain your wife, but I also want to be with Mike. After discussing this with him, we decided that it would be fair if I spent one week with you and the next with him. Without saying a word, I got out of bed, hurriedly dressed and left the house. My destination was my office, where I sought solace behind a closed door. With a heavy heart, I dialed Lopez's number. When he entered the room, he looked at my unkempt face, but refrained from asking questions. Seeing that I was constantly staying up late, he understood the reason for my disheveled appearance. I made it clear to him that I didn't want to be disturbed unless it was an extremely important matter. Fortunately, my request was respected, and I was left alone. Reflecting on the situation, I wondered if she was really that forgetful, or if I had somehow fallen into an alternate reality. For several hours I sat in a dimly lit office, repeatedly scrutinizing the offer made by my wife. It seemed to me the epitome of egocentrism. Nancy seemed to want to get both benefits and pleasure without making any compromises. It was clear that everything would not go as planned. She had no choice but to make a decision. I got home around 5 o'clock, but I was furious at the sight of Mike's car parked at the entrance. This brute really had the nerve. It took me a good five minutes to calm down and let my anger dissipate. Reluctantly, I left the gun on the dashboard of the car, knowing full well that bringing it inside could only lead to catastrophic consequences. Despite years of training, nothing could have prepared me for such a situation. When I entered the living room, they were sitting there, visibly nervous. Nancy got up quickly and came over to kiss me, but I instinctively pushed her away. I noticed her pain, but remained indifferent. Nancy spoke anxiously. We really need to discuss this. I answered sharply. There is nothing to discuss. You have to choose between him and me. You can't have both of us. Mike, feeling awkward, looked at me and said, I don't think you fully considered this offer. I'm not trying to take your wife away from you. I just want to give her the extra love she needs. Yes, we will share her, but she will never neglect her duties as a wife. The inner rage in me has reached its peak. This arrogant man had the audacity to suggest that I agree to Nancy sleeping with him because she supposedly needs more affection. I felt disgusted with both of them. At that moment, I realized that my marriage was beyond repair. I refused to comply with this offer. Nancy said with a disapproving expression, Nick! We're going all the way. The only question is whether you will participate in this or not. Leave our house with him, I said. Nancy's tears flowed uncontrollably as she begged me. Please, Nick, let me do this. I've been faithful to you all these years. Mike was my first love, but I don't want to lose you. My love for you is immense, but I still have feelings for Mike. I snorted and turned to face him, looking for an answer. Tell me, Mike, if your late wife had approached you with such an offer, would you have agreed? Mike's face softened as he answered, If it would bring happiness to my wife, I would willingly agree. A smile appeared on his lips. Nancy looked at me again, her eyes full of hope and uncertainty. What about you, dear? If I came home with my ex? Nancy paused, considering her answer. If you had shared yourself with her, I admit that at first it would have upset me, as well as how you feel now. But since I truly love you and want your happiness above all else, I would eventually come to terms with it. Despite this, I have to express my concern, because I still have unresolved emotions about this situation. Taking a deep breath, I continued. Given the circumstances, I think it would be better for us to contact a lawyer tomorrow to start the divorce process. Fortunately, the division of our assets seems to be quite simple. Since there is only a small mortgage left on the house, we can sell it and split the proceeds equally as soon as we pay off the mortgage. Despite the fact that Nancy had to make a difficult decision, she remained firm in her desire for an amicable settlement. Savings and checking accounts will be separated and Jill's college fund will remain intact, she said. 
There will be no alimony because you will live with a man who sits here and is an asshole. Now both of you please leave the room. Nancy started crying when Mike grabbed her hand. When she reached the door Nancy looked back at me and said, Nick, remember that the door is always open. If you change your mind, know that I really love you and want you in my life. Feeling a surge of anger, I went to the door and slammed it shut. After that, I went to the office and started making a complete list of things that required my attention. One of the top priorities was to find a lawyer, and without hesitation, I knew exactly who to turn to. Dustin Brown. Known for his tenacity and skill in divorce proceedings, he gained a formidable reputation as a tireless defender of wives. Unhappy husbands who became victims of his legal tactics often found themselves blinded, unaware of the impending storm. Over the years our paths have crossed, and more than once I was ready to help him, even when it wasn't necessary. My motivation was an unshakable knowledge of the vile people he sought to bring to justice. They deserved retribution for every ounce. When I continued working on the list, the next important point was the analysis and evaluation of our common property. I uploaded the house data to an online platform. As a precaution, I transferred 50% of our funds to my personal accounts. I have taken the necessary steps to cancel our shared credit cards and issue a new one exclusively in my name. Looking through my checklist, I realized that there was only one important task left to contact Jill and tell her the truth about the situation. Just the thought of telling our girl about her mother's act caused me deep mental pain. It took Jill a full five minutes to come to her senses before she could articulate her thoughts clearly. I was stunned by her unexpected response. Has she gone mad? Turned into a crazy creature? You've been incredibly kind to us all these years and I refuse to have anything to do with her. I will not keep in touch with her, I will consider her dead to myself. Jill, I said calmly. I understand that you are very upset right now and I sympathize with your emotions. Nancy is still your mother and she loves you wholeheartedly. Please don't let this incident ruin your relationship with her. If you continue, it will be a loss for all of us. Could you at least wait a few days before discussing this with your mother? I asked. If she calls me, I will express my strong disapproval, the daughter replied. Please, if she calls, refrain from answering for a few days. Can you promise me that? Reluctantly, she agreed to comply with my request. Later that evening, Nancy expressed her concern to me, unsuccessfully trying to reach her daughter. I calmed Nancy down by telling her that I had already talked to Jill, and she was visibly upset. I informed Nancy that our daughter needed to be alone to collect her thoughts before she was ready to resolve this issue with either of us. I suspect that you may have influenced her negative perception of me. Nancy accused me of poisoning our daughter's mind against her. I categorically denied such actions, explaining that I had simply informed her that her mother had been forced to abandon our relationship and seek new opportunities in Aldwych. I conveyed this information calmly, knowing that it would most likely anger her. Before Nancy could answer, I decided to bring up one of the issues on the agenda. Nancy replied with a simple, Oh, while I have the opportunity to talk to you, I strongly recommend that you consult with a lawyer. I'm asking you not to make this decision, she begged, and tears flowed down her face again. It really hurts me that you want to cut me out of your life. My love for you remains unshakable. Can't you find the strength to compromise for us? Have you even thought about it? She said, abruptly ending the conversation. Having decided to settle everything, I decided to take a week off to devote myself fully to this issue. But the nights turned out to be unbearable. The overwhelming loneliness, when I was lying in bed alone, weighed on me. Every morning, I instinctively turned to Nancy. At first I decided to contact Dustin to remind him of her absence. I was caught off guard when Dustin informed me that Mike had already contacted him. This scheming scoundrel turned out to be cunning and obviously did a thorough research to find a better divorce lawyer than me. I expressed my annoyance. Well, if I can't use your services, 
Could you at least recommend someone I should hire? Dustin snorted at the mention of Mike addressing him, but clarified, I didn't say he hired me. I informed him that I'd already been hired for this job. Wow, I replied feeling a surge of relief. I am very grateful that you took care of this for me. Nick, it's no secret that most men in this city perceive me as an antagonist, he said bitterly. But you've always treated me with respect. You helped me when it wasn't necessary, and I've always appreciated that in you. I want you to know, I will never take her side. Thanks a lot again, although you'll still have to pay me a fee, he chuckled. I sincerely appreciate your understanding, but I also have financial obligations that need to be fulfilled. It's not a problem, Dustin. Thanks again. Despite the fact that it took several days to relieve the tension, the phone conversation between Nancy and Jill did not go smoothly. According to Jill, it escalated into a heated argument with hurtful insults. Nancy called me later, being on the verge of hysteria and believing that she had lost her daughter forever. But this is just the beginning. There is even more at stake. I assured her that I would talk to her and try to resolve the situation. After passing on my message, I ended the conversation. I had no idea that the task would be much more difficult than expected. Jill's anger didn't subside when I spoke to her again about a week later. My daughter informed me that she had made it clear to her mother that she no longer wanted to have anything to do with her. Nancy was not invited to her graduation, to her future wedding, or even to a meeting with potential grandchildren. It was at this moment that I finally understood the reason for Nancy's severe distress. You are my real daughter, I assured her, without resorting to a DNA test. She laughed softly in response. Nancy's persistent calls continued until the very day of the official registration of the divorce. She constantly begged me to change my mind and agree to the proposed agreement. But my resolve remained unshakable. As soon as the divorce was finalized, I felt relieved. The calls abruptly stopped, and I was able to focus on further work. Fortunately, my hard work as the head of the detective department has given me a much-needed respite. With a flexible schedule at my disposal, I immersed myself in my responsibilities, becoming more active and proactive over the next six months. I have taken responsibility for actively mentoring our newly minted detectives, making sure that they do not stray from the path and do not receive unproductive leads. In addition, I have devoted my time to a thorough study of our collection of cold cases, and my efforts were not in vain we triumphantly solved a murder case that we had long forgotten about. Surprisingly, it turned out that the real culprit was an ex-boyfriend, and the evidence was lying under our noses, remaining unnoticed until now. In recognition of this achievement, I was awarded a commendation and a well-deserved salary increase. After my divorce, Nancy wasted no time marrying Mike, which led to their interest in buying my part of the house. I couldn't bear the thought of Mike living in my old house. His threats to sue to get the sale didn't scare me at all. I stood my ground without flinching. Thanks to the help of local appraisers, I managed to significantly increase the value of the property. Even though the price was too high, Mike made a deal. Although his audacity annoyed me at first, I eventually found a glimmer of hope. The sale brought in much more profit than I could have imagined. To my surprise, the divorce process turned out to be more favorable than I expected. I was looking through real estate listings on the internet when I came across a beautiful apartment that immediately caught my attention. Its location was perfect, just a stone's throw from my workplace. Inspired by the prospect of owning my own home, I delved into the details. Diving into the financial aspect, I realized that I should be grateful to Dustin. His meticulous questioning played a crucial role in discovering important information that could work in my favor. It turned out that the initial payment for our house was received from the inheritance of my beloved grandfather. This discovery meant that the funds were not considered common property. Armed with this knowledge, I found myself in an advantageous position. When the house was sold, 
I received about 75% of the proceeds, a significant amount that allowed me to make a fateful decision. Without hesitation, I decided to take a bold step to buy an apartment in this building. That evening, as I continued to look through the real estate listings, I couldn't help feeling excited and excited. The idea that I would become the owner of a property so conveniently located next to my workplace was a dream come true. It seemed that the apartment perfectly matched my lifestyle and aspirations. It was about eight months after Mike and Nancy's wedding when I suddenly found myself having dinner at a restaurant alone. To my surprise, Nancy came over to my table and sat down. Despite the fact that her presence took me by surprise, I made a conscious decision not to react to her with hostility. Looking around, I noticed Mike, who was sitting at a table at the other end of the room and was carefully studying the menu. How are you, Nick? Nancy asked softly. I'm fine, I replied, forcing myself to smile. And yours? I asked. I still feel like I miss you every day, she confessed. Gently placing her hand on mine, she confessed. My love for you is still deep. If you ever find the strength in your heart to accept Mike, I will do my best to be with you again. At first, I thought about taking my hand away and waving away her request. But then an idea struck me. This scheme required a preliminary conversation with Jill. But at the same time, it gave a chance to take revenge on this sneaky Mike. I must admit, Nancy, I miss you very much too. It's been a hard morning without you, but you're a married woman now. I guess your husband is looking for you. Nancy shot a quick glance at Mike, who looked puzzled. She confirmed my words with a nod and then rose gracefully from her chair. Remember that my love for you is unshakable, she whispered and gracefully walked towards her husband. My God, I had no idea how amazingly ignorant this woman was. In the evening, I contacted Jill and outlined my plan to her. At first, she was shocked and expressed her disbelief. As I explained the reasons for my venture, her tone gradually changed, and soon there was laughter on her side. Wow, Dad, this is just perfect! Jill burst out laughing. You definitely have to agree. The next day, after receiving my daughter's enthusiastic approval, I called Nancy. I expressed a desire to talk to her and Mike, and she readily agreed, setting up a meeting at our old house at 7 o'clock in the evening. I arrived quickly at 7, and Nancy showed me into the living room. It annoyed me that Mike was lying quietly on the couch, in the very place that used to belong to me. Despite the obvious displeasure reflected in his frown, I found some comfort in the expression written on his face. It was clear that Nancy had set up this unexpected meeting for him, judging by the piercing daggers he pointed at me. I kept calm and pretended not to notice anything. When Nancy served us coffee and settled between me and her husband on the couch, I quickly got to the bottom of the matter. Wasting no time, I asked Nancy about the sincerity of her offer. Did she really mean that? A radiant smile instantly lit up Nancy's face as she replied, assuring me with complete confidence. Of course, Nick. I'm still true to every word. My love for you is still deep, and my offer remains open. I have to admit that I have feelings for Mike, too. If you are willing to consider this idea, I will carefully agree to such an agreement. Now it seems to me that I have lost all of you. But with such a compromise, a part of you will be present in my life, even at a certain time. Due to the lack of your presence, I feel incredibly isolated. Nancy's reaction was instant and violent. She rushed into my arms and kissed me with such force that it stirred up long-forgotten emotions. Nick! She exclaimed. Gasping for breath, she exclaimed, You just made me the happiest woman in the world! Now I can get the love of both men! Mike, clearly agitated, got up from his seat. He interjected, Wait, we didn't talk about it. It's practically the same situation. Keeping calm, I turned to Mike and said, Yes, but we've already discussed this. Mike, getting more and more heated, insisted. Anyway, Nancy and I need to have a proper discussion. Nancy supported him, confirming, We've already discussed this. Mike's objections took me by surprise. 
We discussed this issue in advance, and he expressed his willingness to share his wife if it would make her happy. It was unpleasant for me to see Mike struggling to pronounce words, and the disappointment was visible on his flushed face. Despite this setback, he continued to insist on the need for a more detailed discussion. Although I really wanted to point out Brian's hypocrisy, I decided to hold back and give Nancy and Mike the opportunity to talk on their own, without my interference. I'll leave you both to deal with this, I said, stepping aside. Nancy, I'll be waiting for your choice. With that, I leaned over and gave her another passionate kiss, this time with a French twist. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed how furious Mike was. Getting into the car, I couldn't help but laugh. I successfully outplayed this arrogant guy. Mike felt awkward now. I imagined what kind of conversation would happen between them that night. The situation has completely changed, and it was very pleasant. When the next day came, anticipation filled the air. Nancy called me and told me that Mike was very upset at first. But Nancy decided to take a bold step and told him about his hypocritical behavior, threatening to leave if he did not agree. Surprisingly, he finally gave up. They came to an agreement and drew up a schedule according to which Nancy spent one week with me and the other with Mike. Mike insisted that we could not continue this agreement until I had been tested for sexually transmitted diseases. I couldn't help but doubt the feasibility of their plan. Are they really that forgetful? I decided to take the test, but I made it clear that Nancy and Mike should also be tested. If Nancy didn't mind, then Mike was clearly unhappy. The results turned out to be clean for all of us. The next week, I went to their house, and Mike was waiting for me at the entrance. After parking, I entered the house and greeted Nancy with a kiss. I politely asked her to bring me some water. While she was following her, I couldn't resist provoking Mike by saying, Hey Mike, I'm going to spend the whole night with your wife, mimicking Ric Flair's tone. He was instantly furious, and it was obvious that he wanted to engage in a physical fight with me. I deliberately provoked him, anticipating his reaction. I made it clear to him that any aggressive actions towards me would lead to serious consequences, reminding him that attacking a police officer would not end well for him. Nancy handed me the bottle, which made Mike visibly angry. Despite the fact that he was seething with rage, he managed to suppress it by hiding his emotions. Trying to prove his superiority, he passionately kissed Nancy right in front of my eyes while I just kissed her on the cheek. Turning to Mike, I sarcastically thanked him for his cooperation and left, leaving him to decode my message. The next day, I watched three separate teams of detectives working at different crime scenes. As I headed to the second place, a distress signal sounded on the radio, alerting me to the riots taking place in the kitty cat bar. Once I was only one block away from home, I went out of curiosity to look for it. Upon arrival, I was greeted by disturbing news about riots involving a man under the influence of alcohol. To my surprise, the drunk turned out to be none other than Mike. Having decided to personally investigate the situation, I quickly dismissed the two officers, assuring them that I would deal with the matter myself. Turning my attention to Mike, I gently took his hand and said, Come on, Mike, let me take you home. In a fit of defiance, he resolutely refused my help, exclaiming, I don't need your help. Faced with his resistance, I confronted him with a choice, firmly stating, Mike, you have two options. I can either take you home or put you in jail. What do you prefer? He decided to accept the offer of a ride home. We didn't exchange a single word all the way to my former place of residence. When he got out of my car, his only comment was a snide insult. After dropping him off, I went up to him and advised him, Don't waste any time. You only have six days left before I come and pick up your wife. By the fourth day, Mike's enthusiasm for the agreement had quickly waned. He and Nancy began to argue more often because of the current situation. He wanted it all to stop, but Nancy didn't understand his reasoning. Finally, when it was time to pick up Nancy for the planned week of living together, the situation seems to have reached a boiling point. 
Mike and Nancy began to have a heated argument in the front yard. Determined to restore peace, I intervened to defuse the tension. I think you both should calm down before the situation gets out of control, I said calmly, keeping a slight grin on my face. Otherwise, someone may find it necessary to involve the authorities. Mike, filled with anger, stared at me and then turned his attention to Nancy. If you decide to go with him, then our relationship is over, he hissed. Nancy, who did not like to back down, sharply replied to him. Mike, we have agreed on a mutually beneficial agreement. I have not experienced anything like this during our previous meetings. Throughout our acquaintance with Mike, my ex-wife always spoke to him only with love and warmth. But this time, Mike felt disappointed and exclaimed, This agreement is worthless. He raised his voice, making it clear that he was on the verge of breaking down. In response, I warned Nancy once again, If you decide to be with him, it will be the end of our relationship. Nancy simply waved off his threat, dismissing it with a casual gesture. She answered confidently, That's not what you mean. She reminded him that he was the one who originally suggested the idea of sharing, which she found funny and liked very much. Nancy's worried expression, although it seemed forced, heightened the tension of the moment. I watched as Mike stormed into the house in a rage and slammed the door. I turned to Nancy for clarification, who only shrugged her shoulders in response. He's acting like a child, she remarked, twining her hand with mine. He'll calm down soon and everything will go back to normal. Maybe you should talk to him and try to make a relationship work. I'll pick you up later in the evening, I informed her before heading to the office. Unfortunately, normal life did not resume as expected. In fact, everything was going as well as possible, which took me by surprise. Later that day, a call came in from a detective, which further complicated the situation. Sir, I regret to inform you that a tragic incident has occurred. There was a crime that shocked me. When I inquired about the victim's identity, I was horrified to learn that it was Nancy. According to Mike, the perpetrator, it was an impulsive act caused by anger. We have detained Mike and are now taking him for questioning. This news overwhelms me with guilt over Nancy's untimely death. I am deeply concerned about how to break this terrifying news to Jill, as I fear she may hold a grudge against me for my involvement in this situation. Despite my desire to be present during Mike's interrogation, the team, knowing about my personal history with him, advised me to keep my distance. Reluctantly, I agreed and returned to my office. I dialed Jill's number and told her what had happened. As expected, she didn't put the blame on me, but kept silent. She just asked for some time and said she would call when she felt better. I didn't say anything else. After that, Mike was escorted to prison for the necessary legal procedures and paperwork began. After the autopsy, I took responsibility for issuing documents for Nancy's body and began preparations for the funeral. The next day, Jill joined me, and we hugged tightly, both burst into tears. I'm so sorry, Jill, I whispered through my sobs. It's all because of me. In response, she reassured me. You're not guilty, Dad. She assured me that it wasn't my fault. When I was sitting in my office, there was a knock on the door and a woman came in. Introducing herself as Aria from the FBI, she quickly showed her ID. She explained that they needed the weapons used in the Nancy case. I was stunned by the directness and speed of her request. She handed me some documents and informed me that the suspect, Mike, was under investigation for committing a crime against his previous wife, who was believed to have died in an accident. This discovery came as a surprise to me, since Mike had not been considered a suspect before. Her father managed to pull off several moves and get us involved in this case, even though he was in Japan. But I couldn't help but wonder how he could be in Japan and the USA on the same day, given the time difference. The police cleverly used this in their report. He landed in Japan, boarded a plane 30 minutes later and arrived in the United States. An amazing feat, isn't it? And remember, you haven't heard any of this from me, she said. I nodded in understanding and continued my inquiries. For what purpose do you keep these weapons? According to our suspicions, 
This is the same weapon that was used in the previous incident with his ex-wife. We completed all the necessary procedures and handed it over to her. We will provide you with a report that you can use in court in this case. After giving this information, she got up from her seat and left. Three months have passed. Mike has been found guilty in both cases and is currently serving a 30-year sentence in prison. For the next week, Jill stayed with me while we mourned her mother. More than six months have passed, and when I returned to the empty house, I fell into silence. My heart is filled with bittersweet memories of happier times, but they only increase the pain inside me. If only Nancy hadn't made such a stupid choice, I wish things had been different. Waking up on a peaceful Sunday morning, I turned my gaze to my beloved wife Rose, with whom we had been married for five happy years. When she woke up, she gently pulled me to her and bit into my lips with a gentle kiss. Rosa expressed her fatigue from the previous night and asked to refrain from intimate relations this morning. I understood her fatigue, but the desire to conceive a child made me persevere. Hugging me tightly, Rose assured me that patience would eventually lead to the realization of our dream of parenthood. We spent some time in bed, having a conversation that inevitably turned to her professional aspirations. Rose's thoughts were consumed by her burning desire to be promoted to the respected position of regional sales manager. After enduring a few minutes of this familiar conversation, I invited her to take a shower, and I went to get her favorite specialty coffee. Rose approved of the idea, and as I was heading for the door, I suddenly remembered that my car keys were missing. Remembering that Rose carries spare keys in her purse just in case, I noticed that her purse was lying on the kitchen table. Instead of going back upstairs, I decided to get the keys out of her purse. Looking into the depths of her bag, I was amazed at how difficult it is to find something in the chaos. But my search led me to a hidden zipper inside the compartments of the handbag. Curious, I unzipped the zipper and found a stash of birth control pills. This finding seemed strange to me, as Rose assured me that she had stopped taking them a couple of months ago, as we were actively trying to conceive a child. After examining the packaging, I noticed that a significant part of the pills had been consumed. Turning her over, I saw a prescription label indicating that she had recently purchased a new supply of contraceptives. Carefully putting everything back in its place, I silently, without arousing Rose's suspicions, took out the car keys and went upstairs. Countless thoughts raced through my head as I went to get coffee. I couldn't understand why she lied to me that she had stopped taking birth control. Although I was sure she wasn't having an affair, since she spent most of her time either at work or with me, her close friend was married to my best friend, which left no room for mystery. The only unaccounted for time was during her working hours, which puzzled me. I was deeply disappointed, because it seemed that she did not want to have children, although, apparently, she tried. Around four o'clock in the afternoon, Rose shook me to get my attention, and asked what was wrong with me, because I had been distracted all day. Confused, I asked where we were going. She reminded me that we were planning to have dinner at Bill and Sherry's house. After dinner, Bill asked me to help him in the store. Once there, he noticed that something was bothering me and asked me to share it. Reluctantly, I admitted that I had discovered that Rose had stopped taking birth control a couple of months ago. We discussed the possible reasons, and Bill suggested hiring a private investigator to find out the truth. Despite my belief that Rose was not having an affair, Bill demanded that I prove it. Following Bill's advice, I hired a private investigator from our company for security purposes. He assured me that based on the information he had received, it did not look like Rose was having an affair with another man. He promised to monitor her actions both at work and outside. He also advised checking her medical record, as there may be other factors. Although the private investigator regularly reported the latest news, I did not receive any significant news. Despite my attempts to hide my emotions, my intimacy with Rose suffered. 
Rose eventually came out to me on Saturday and demanded to know why I was avoiding her. I defensively accused her of not wanting sex, which caused a heated argument, our first serious quarrel. When I confided in Bill, he warned me that if I didn't change my behavior quickly, Rose would suspect that I was up to something. Taking Bill's advice to heart, I humbly apologized to Rose, explaining my behavior as fear. She looked confused and worried at the same time, which made me wonder if she was having an affair for the first time. Bill, who was trying to keep his mind, helped me focus and keep a positive attitude. By the middle of the third week, I started thinking about Rose's upcoming 25th birthday and wanted to plan something special. Bill's wife, Sherry, came up with the idea of throwing a birthday party for me. She suggested cutting the cane in half and doing other similar things. On Thursday morning, I met with a private investigator hoping for a short meeting, which eventually lasted more than two hours. After the detective left, I sat alone in a daze until the phone rang. It was Bill, who knew that I had just met with a private investigator. I told him that we needed to meet and that I needed a stronger drink. By the time Bill showed up at the bar, I was already finishing my third cocktail. Bill looked at me and immediately realized that something was wrong. The initial shock of what I discovered passed, replaced by a growing anger that consumed me. I handed the evidence folder to Bill, and he began to study the photos with dates and times. He asked about the CD in the folder and I explained that it contained a video recording of Rose, my wife, having an intimate relationship with her boss. A private investigator advised me to watch the video and pay attention to the dialogue, suggesting that I would be surprised by Rose's motives. Bill called his wife and asked her to take Rose to the cinema or the mall, as we were planning to celebrate her birthday. Sherry, of course, was thrilled, thinking she was helping Rose with something good. Bill and I watched the CD, which brought tears to my eyes, and the private investigator was right. I was completely surprised by the reason Rose was with her boss. Rose slept with her boss for one reason, to get the promotion she's been talking about all these months. We sat in silence and just drank, saying only that you want another drink, and of course I answered yes. After a long silence, I said to Bill, You know if Rose came to me and said she was in love with her boss, or if she said she wasn't satisfied with the sex life she was getting from me and she needed something more, I know I can handle it. Of course it would hurt me, as it does now. In fact I would be full of resentment and disappointment. I would feel that even though I gave my all to the marriage, I would feel like I let Rose. Now I'm sitting here watching my wife sleep with her boss just to get a damn promotion. I'm not just offended, I'm also mad as hell and by God Rose will feel how angry I am. Bill said, watching her sleep with the boss, you realize that she seems to be around, but she's not. You know what I mean. Well, it doesn't matter now because she put her job ahead of her marriage, and now she's going to have to live with her decision. When Bill handed me my drink, he said the girls would be coming home soon. Do you know what you're going to do? Yes. Yes, I think so. I looked up at Bill. Next Monday is Rose's birthday and I want to throw her a surprise party that she will never forget. Time is running out so I need your help, and I'd like to involve Sherry in this if you don't mind. Bill agreed, but reminded me that Sherry and Rose are close friends, and Sherry won't do anything to hurt Rose. I assured him that I didn't need Sherry for that, I just needed her help in inviting the right people to the party. In addition, I asked Bill to attend the party to help me carry out my plan. To keep my intentions a secret, I pretended to be more drunk than I actually was when the girls returned home. The next day at work, I found a person with computer skills in the delivery department who could fulfill my special requests. I explained to him that I needed photos and videos, and he assured me that it would not be difficult. Then I contacted Sherry and informed her of my plan, stressing that I wanted the party to remain a surprise. We agreed to have a party on Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I asked Sherry to help me get in touch with all the necessary people. I also asked her to find a way to keep Rose out of the house for a few hours on Sunday. Before I ended the conversation, I said that I would inform Rose's parents about the surprise party. 
Later, I went into Rose's office and invited her boss to a party, explaining that it would be a surprise for her birthday. I even suggested that he take his wife with him to make it more pleasant for her. To make the party go unnoticed, I advised him to park at the nearest school so that when Rose's friend brought her home, she would not notice the presence of a large number of cars. My brother will be responsible for escorting the guests from the party venue to my house. It promises to be an amazing event, and I hope that he will be able to attend. After work, I visited Rose's parents and shared my idea of a birthday celebration. Rose's mom has collected various photos of Rose, starting with her birth and ending with our wedding. Later that evening, I met with a computer expert at his house. I handed him all the collected materials and told him about my vision of the evening. He didn't say anything special, but after listening carefully to me, he suggested an alternative approach that would have a greater effect on everyone. I was intrigued by his offer and, agreeing, he assured me that everything would be ready by Saturday. On Wednesday, I visited the lawyer's office to begin the divorce process, citing adultery as the reason. The lawyer also advised me to sue Rose's boss and the company they both worked for. He expressed confidence that we would be able to receive financial compensation from Rose's company. On Friday evening, I sat across from Bill feeling overwhelmed by the situation. When you think it can't get any worse, you always find a way out, I confessed to him. Bill asked curiously what I meant. On Wednesday, I had a longer than expected meeting with a lawyer. When I left the office, my thoughts were preoccupied with marital problems, as a result of which I forgot to return to work and apply for a tender. As a result, the company did not receive the order and I was suspended from work for 30 days without pay. Fortunately, my boss, who knows about my family problems, intervened and prevented my dismissal. He wants me to distance myself from Rose and the mess we're in so I can focus and come to my senses. He offered me his timeshare in Mexico, insisting that if I wanted to keep my job, I had to be there no later than Wednesday. Bill asked if I planned to go and I replied with a categorical, Yes. I can't afford to lose this job. And now let's discuss the details and possibilities for a surprise party in honor of Rose's birthday. I explained how the photos would be displayed and shared my vision of the evening. I also asked Bill to make sure that Rose's boss didn't miss the whole show. I informed Bill that the man playing the bartender would also hand Rose and her boss divorce papers. When I got home, Rose was furious and demanded to know where I had been. I mentioned casually that I was with Bill, downplaying the significance of the situation, but Rose insisted that it was very important because she had great news and I wasn't there to hear it. She accused me of drinking too much and avoiding her, and even suggested that I had a girlfriend. Her accusations infuriated me, and I felt my face turn red with anger. I could see that she was now worried about my reaction, but I remembered Bill's advice and managed to pull myself together. I swallowed my pride, apologized, and assured her that I didn't have a girlfriend. I begged her to tell me the good news she mentioned. To my surprise, Rose excitedly announced that she had been promoted and would be the new regional sales manager starting next month. She jumped for joy and then rushed to me and hugged me tightly. At that moment, I realized that she was capable of surprising me even more than I thought. Still holding her close, I asked her what she meant when she said she wanted to have a baby. Rose quickly returned to my arms and explained that we were lucky, and she was sure that everything was finally going its way. She regarded her promotion as a sign of positive changes in our lives. I love you very much, and I know that you will make me a mother. She looked at me, her eyes full of hope and asked, You want to start a family, don't you, darling? Rose thought that my tears were tears of joy at the prospect of having a child, but she did not know that they were tears of sadness at the realization that I would soon lose the only woman I had ever loved. Taking my hand, Rose led me into her bedroom, and we made passionate love. The next morning she wanted more intimacy, but I was just doing my job. As I stood in the shower, lost in my thoughts, Rose came in and joined me. Rose's worried expression made her ask if something was bothering me. 
She admitted that for several weeks I had not behaved as usual, and had been drinking a lot. I quickly came up with a story, blaming myself for the fact that we couldn't conceive a child. I assumed that there might be something wrong with my body, and that I should see a doctor. After all, she hadn't taken birth control for months, right? Without answering my question, Rose hugged me tightly and assured me that I was taking too much on myself. She thought that now that she had been promoted at work, she would feel better, and somehow she knew that I would impregnate her soon. I couldn't help but think that she could explain it if she really wanted to. That Saturday night, Rose wanted intimacy again, and this time I reciprocated her feelings. She felt that there was a lack of genuine emotion in my lovemaking. It was just physical intimacy. Sunday morning came, and I was surprisingly calm. While Rose was taking a shower, I called Sherry and asked if she had a plan to pick Rose up from home. Sherry assured me that there was, and expressed pride that I had organized a surprise party for Rose, knowing that it would be an unforgettable event. I almost burst out laughing at the thought, realizing how unforgettable it would be. As Rose was coming down the stairs, I asked her about her plans for the day. Confused, she asked why. Bill called and asked you to help him today because Sherry assigned him to work on a to-do list, I explained. Rose responded enthusiastically, agreeing to join Sherry and Bill for breakfast and then help Sherry choose curtains for their bedroom. At 3.10 p.m., Sherry followed Rose into our house, and everyone screamed, Surprise! Rose was genuinely stunned and hugged me, expressing her gratitude for the unexpected holiday. As I looked around the room and watched all the guests, I heard Rose ask Sherry if she had invited her boss. When Sherry replied in the negative, I noticed that Rose's worried expression had returned. When my two key people took their seats, the party began with laughter and communication. I waited for almost two hours, making sure that everyone had food, but most importantly, an adequate supply of alcohol. With Bill's help, we gathered everyone and led them into the living room, preparing for the event of the year. Thank you all for coming, I said to the audience, but before we let Rose open her cards and gifts, let's take a look at the first half of her 25th birthday celebration. Looking around, I couldn't help but smile at the presence of Rose's parents, her cousin, and even her boss, who brought his wife. Finally, everyone took their seats, looking forward to the start of the show. Since everyone knew about the theme of the party, there was anticipation in the room. I turned on the TV and plugged in the laptop, announcing, Let's get started. The first image on the screen was of a naked two-month-old Rose lying on a bed. The crowd booed and roared when I jokingly commented on how delightfully I spat on her. Rose blushed deeply as picture after picture slowly appeared on the screen. Each time I made a joking or explanatory comment, often asking her mother for help, which led to many laughing at Rose in a good mood. The photos showed her path from elementary to high school. When her graduation photo appeared, I took the opportunity to praise Rose for her dedication. If Rose is striving for something, she will stop at nothing to achieve it, I said. Then we moved on to college photos and I jokingly told her that, thanks to her dedication, Rose hooked up with me as a student. Laughter filled the room, and Rose enjoyed my entertainment. Then our wedding photo appeared, prompting joking comments about my then long hair. After that, an image of the building where Rose works appeared on the screen, and I informed everyone, Rose works here. The following image showed her desktop. I explained that she got this desk thanks to a promotion after she became a top salesperson. As I said before, when Rose sets a goal for herself, she always achieves it, regardless of obstacles. In the next photo, Boss Rose and his wife are sitting at our table during a party in honor of former MOE employees. Rose was sitting next to her boss, and next to her was another employee. However, I wasn't in the picture. Rose's smile disappeared, replaced by a familiar worried expression. I glanced at her boss, who also seemed to have lost his smile. Moreover, I noticed that they exchanged glances. 
I told everyone that I sincerely hope that Rose's boss will recognize and appreciate her continued dedication, hard work, and support her desire to be promoted to the position of regional sales manager, which she so longs for. As I was finishing my statement, my eyes were fixed on Rose. To my surprise, I noticed an expression of fear on her face, since she had previously admitted to me that she wanted to get this position. Consequently, my comment now caused her fear, as she wondered if I had somehow revealed her secret. With a sense of urgency, I pressed the button to start the video recording, addressing everyone present. It is impossible to adequately convey the tremendous efforts that Rose has put into achieving this new role. Let's move on to the photos, shall we? The video began, showing an unoccupied bed, and my wife's voice talking to the boss, saying that this meeting would be the last, according to their agreement. As soon as Rose fell silent, the video quickly switched to her lying on the bed while her boss engaged in intimate intimacy with her. A collective sigh swept through the hall, causing several people to hurriedly leave. The video shifted dramatically again, capturing Rose on all fours while her boss, standing behind her, continued his movements. When the scene changed, Rose's boss exclaimed, Damn girl, with such dedication you will rise to the status of vice president. The video lasted about 15 seconds, and there were still 15 seconds left to demonstrate two more positions, but then chaos began. Rose jumped up, screaming for me to stop the video, tears streaming down her face as she apologized. Her boss tried to leave quickly, but he was intercepted by my friend Bill, who firmly ordered him to stay put. When the boss tried to get around Bill, he received a powerful blow to the jaw from Bill's fist, which forced him to return to his seat. Another member of my team shouted out the boss's name and, upon receiving an answer, said, You have received a summons, and threw legal documents into his lap. At this time, Sherry, busy comforting Rose, did not notice how the boss's wife came up from the side. The boss's wife grabbed Sherry by the hair and forcefully pushed her away, causing her to stumble and fall onto the couch next to her. At the same time, Sherry yanked Rose's arm, forcing her to turn to face the boss's wife. When she was hurling insults at my wife, I saw her deliver a powerful blow right to Rose's cheekbone. Rose was thrown back. Eventually, she fell on her back and slowly rolled onto her side. In response, Sherry jumped to her feet and ran screaming to the boss's wife, trying to intervene. Bill was quickly approaching the women when Sherry was pushed violently again, but this time Bill managed to catch her before she fell to the floor. I hurried to intervene, but since Rose was already on the floor and Bill was holding Sherry, I decided that the worst was over. The boss's wife turned around and started verbally attacking Rose. Rose, who was on her knees, reached for the ottoman and put her hand on it. Slowly raising her knee, she tried to stand up, putting her foot on the carpet. When Rose stood up, her back was facing the boss's wife, and her feet were about a foot apart. I went over to Rose to help her, and make sure she wasn't hit again. When I turned my head to see where the boss's wife was, I saw that she had taken a full step towards my wife. Then, as an NFL player, she kicked Rose right in the middle between her legs. I was just putting my hand on Rose's arm, when I felt a blow that made Rose's whole body shudder. If the boss's wife had been hitting a soccer ball, it would have easily flown 40 yards. Rose's body rose two or three feet forward. She let out a scream louder than I've ever heard. Rose landed on the ottoman, bounced off it and fell on her side. She continued to scream from the moment she was kicked until she finally landed on the carpet. Once on the carpet, Rose curled up hugging her knees to her chest and clasping her hands between her legs and sobbed as hard as I had never heard. Bill grabbed the boss's wife by the neck and forcibly dragged her out of the house, telling her and her pathetic husband to leave. While Bill was escorting the boss's wife out, she was screaming, I bet you won't get promoted now. Sherry rushed to Rose's aid, screaming for me to move away. Ignoring Sherry's pleas, I went up to Rose and told her that I never meant her any harm. Rose was in so much pain that I realized she couldn't hear me. Looking down, I noticed blood seeping into her cotton trousers, 
I grabbed Sherry to get her attention and pointed at the blood. Sherry immediately told me to call 911. I didn't go with Rose in the ambulance but took my car. I didn't expect such a physical attack, and I didn't want Rose to get hurt. At that moment, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Bill, Sherry and I were sitting in the waiting room when the ER doctor came over to discuss Rose's condition. He informed me that Rosa would be operated on as soon as a specialist arrived. He asked me what happened, and I explained that she had been kicked in the crotch by another woman. After a few more questions, he asked if I wanted to see her, to which I replied with a firm, no. After a few hours, the attending physician finally came out to talk to me. He expressed his amazement, saying that he had never seen such injuries before. The impact was strong, causing the tissues to rupture in three different directions due to the force of the impact. If everything does not heal properly, it can negatively affect her sexual sensations. Curious, I asked about the specific consequences. The doctor explained that the damaged area plays an important role in stimulating a woman during sexual intercourse, contributing to her pleasure and ability to achieve pleasure. At 8.30 p.m., the doctor started to leave, but stopped and looked back at me. He mentioned that Rose had expressed concern about her future fertility. After assuring me, he said that she is still capable of having as many children as we want, but we will have to postpone our plans for several months until she fully recovers and is able to engage in intimacy again. He informed me that she would be in rehab for a few hours before we could visit her. A few minutes later, Bill and I left the hospital, and Sherry stayed. At 8.59 p.m., we stopped for a snack and talked for a while, after which I went home. The following Monday around 10 a.m., Sherry called me. When are you coming to visit Rose? She asked. Not knowing, I answered, probably tomorrow. Sherry immediately began to scold me, and I abruptly interrupted the conversation and turned off the phone. On Tuesday, just after lunch, I went into Rose's room. Sherry gave me a disapproving look as I walked over to Rose's bed. Before Rose could say anything, I spoke up. Rose, I want you to know, I really wanted to insult you, shame you, and make it clear to everyone that it was your actions, not mine, that destroyed our marriage. You lied to me about taking birth control, and you were unfaithful. But I want to clarify that I never intended or wanted to physically harm you. Despite the enormous anger I've never felt before, I've never had the thought of physically hurting you. I hope you can believe me. Tears streamed down her face, and I turned to leave. But Rose reached out and grabbed my shoulder, begging me to stay. She believed that I would never hurt her like that. Reluctantly, I answered, No, I just can't. Rose, I'm leaving town for a month today. You see, because of your infidelity, my mind and heart were in turmoil, and I made a serious mistake at work. The bosses wanted to fire me, but my understanding boss, who knows about our marital problems, intervened and prevented it. Now I'm facing disciplinary action, and my boss has supported me again. I was suspended from work for 30 days without pay. I was informed that I have a 30-day deadline to solve our problems and put my thoughts in order. My boss generously offered me his real estate in Mexico and allowed me to cash out the unused three weeks of vacation. In response to Sherry's request not to leave, I assured her that I could not and did not want to put my job at risk. I also thanked Rose, who taught me to give preference to a career over marriage. Rose immediately apologized and expressed remorse. Turning to Rose, I added that there was one more issue to resolve. I'm not done with her boss yet, and I intend to make him pay for his actions. I assured her that any consequences she would face were not in my plans, because in my opinion she had already suffered enough. But I warned her to be ready, as her boss might sacrifice her to protect himself. The party was cleaned up, and all the materials provided by the private investigator, as well as the divorce papers were on the kitchen table. When I mentioned the divorce papers, Rose squeezed my hand tightly, hoping not to let me pull away, and the tears started flowing again. I left these materials with her not to cause more pain, 
but in case she could use them to protect herself from her boss. I urged her to find a good lawyer and take the necessary precautions. I informed her that it was time for me to get on the plane and leave. Rose firmly stated that she would not sign the divorce papers until we had discussed everything with her. I shook my head, explaining that she was no longer in control of the situation, and I didn't have to do anything for her. When I was about to leave, Rose begged me to wait and asked if she could meet me when I got back. I stopped and turned to face her. With tears in her eyes, she confessed her love to me and asked me to meet her after my return. At that moment I declined her request, explaining that being around her was too painful. Perhaps my point of view will change after returning, but I'm not sure. The trip passed in silence, as Bill was already aware of most of the events and my plan for Rose's boss. I asked him to keep me informed of what was going to happen to her boss. Bill grinned and replied that I still loved her, so he would keep me informed about Rose as well. I laughed and confessed my love for her, but stressed that I couldn't let anyone get around me.